Section 12 of The American Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Catherine Edman. The American Rivals of Sherlock Holmes. The Man Who Spoke Latin. By Samuel Hopkins Adams. Mementos of Average Jones' exploits in his chosen field hang on the walls of his quiet sanctum. Here the favored visitor may see the two red ink dots on a dated sheet of paper, framed in with the card of a chemist and an advertised sale of Lepidoptera, which drove a famous millionaire out of the country. Nearby are displayed the exploitation of a lure for black bass, strangely perforated, a man's reason hung on those pinpricks, and a scrawled legend which seems to spell mercy. Two men's lives were sacrificed to that. While below them, set in somber black, is the funeral notice of a dog worth a million dollars. Facing the call for a trombone player which made a mayor, and the mathematical formula which saved a governor. But nowhere does the observer find any record of one of the advisor's most curious cases, running back two thousand years, for its owner keeps it in his desk drawer, whence the present chronicler exhumed it by accident one day. Average Jones has always insisted that he scored a failure on this, because, through no possible fault of his own, he was unable to restore a document of the highest historical and literary importance. Of that, let the impartial reader judge. It was while Average Jones was waiting for a break of that deadlock of events which, starting from the flat dweller with the poisoned face, finally worked out the strange fate of Telfic Bay, that he sat one morning, breakfasting late, the cool and breezy inner portico of the Cosmic Club, where small tables overlook a gracious fountain shimmering with the dart and poise of goldfish was deserted save for himself a summer engagement star actor a specialist in carbohydrates and a famous adjuster of labor troubles the four men being fairly typical of the club's catholicity of membership contrary to his impeccant habit average jones bore the somewhat frazzled aspect of a man who's been up all night further indication of this in heard in the wide yawn of which he was in mid-enjoyment, when a hand on his shoulder cut short his ecstasy. "'Sorry to interrupt so valuable an exercise,' said a languid voice. "'But—' and the voice stopped. "'Hello, Bert,' returned the adviser, looking up at the faultlessly clad slenderness of his occasional coadjutor, Robert Bertram. Sit down and keep me awake till the human snail who's hypothetically ministering to my wants can get me some coffee. What particular phase of intellectual debauchery have you been up to now? inquired Bertram, lounging into the chair opposite. Trying to forget my troubles by chasing up a promising lead which failed to pan out. Wanted a tin nose. Sounds pretty good, huh? It is music to my untutored ear, answered Bertram. But it turned out to be merely an error of the imbecile, or perhaps facetious printer, who set up the trumpeter's personal column. It should have read, wanted a tea rose. Even that seems far from commonplace. Only a code summons for a meeting of the Rosicrucians. I suppose you know that the order has been revived here in America. Not the true Rosicrucians, surely, said Bertram. They pretend to be a stupid lot who make child's play of it, said Average Jones impatiently. Never mind them. I'd rather know what's on your mind. You made an observation when you came in rather more interesting than your usual output of table talk. You said but, and nothing further. The conjunction but in polite grammar, ordinarily has a comet-like tail to it. Apropos of polite grammar, do you speak Latin? asked Bertram carelessly. Not enough to be gossipy in it. 
then you wouldn't care to give a job to a man who can't speak anything else? On that qualification alone? No, not entirely. He is a good military engineer, I believe. So, that's the other end of the butt, is it? said Average Jones. Go on, elaborate. Bertram laid before his friend a printed clipping in large, clear type, saying, When I read this, I couldn't resist the notion that somehow or other it was in your line. Pursuit of the adventure of life and all that. Let's see what you can make of it. Average Jones straightened in his chair. Latin, he said, and an ad by the look of it. Can our blind friend J. Alden Honeywell have taken to the public prints? Hardly, I think. This is from the Classical Weekly, a Baltimore publication of small and select patronage. Hmm, looks rather alluring, commented Average Jones with a prolonged drawl. Better than the Rosicrucian fakery, anyway. He bent over the clipping, studying these words. Alivius M. F. Prinestinus, quod libet in negotium non in honestum qui victum merium locare velim, literatu sum, scriptum facere bene scio, stipendia multa emeritus, scientiarum belli, prosertim muniendi, sum peritus. Hoc de re pro me spondebit M. Agrippa. Latine tantum solo. Si quis me velet convenere quo vis dei mane adesto in publicis hortis urbis Baltimoriane ad signum apri. Can you make it out? asked Bertram. Hmm. Well, the general sense... Livia seems to yearn in modern print for any honest employment, but especially scrapping of the ancient variety or secretarying. Apply to Agrippa for references. Since he describes his conversation as being confined to Latin, I take it he won't find many jobs reaching out eagerly for him. Anybody who wants him can find him in the park of the wild in Baltimore. That's about what I make of it. Now what's his little lay, I wonder? Some lay of ancient Rome, anyhow, suggested Bertram. Association with Agrippa would have put him back in the first century B.C., wouldn't it? Besides, my informant tells me that Mr. Livius, who seems to have been an all-around sort of person, helped organize fire brigades for Crassus, and was one of the circle of minor poets who wrote rhapsodies to the fair but frail Clodia's eyebrows, earlobes, and insteps. Your informant? The man's actually been seen, then? Oh, yes. He's on view, as per advertisement, I understand. Average Jones rose and stretched his well-knit frame. Baltimore will be hotter than the place that isn't, he said plaintively. Martyrdom by fire. However, I'm off by the five o'clock train. I'll let you know if anything special comes of it, Bert. Barry's splendid bronze boar couches, semi-shaded, in the center of Monument Park, Baltimore's social hilltop. There, Average lounged and strolled through the longest hour of a glaring July morning. People came and went, people of all degrees and descriptions, none of whom suggested in any particular the first century B.C. One individual only maintained any permanency of situation. He was a gaunt, powerful, freckled man of thirty, who sprawled on a settee and regarded Average Jones with obvious and amused interest. In time, this annoyed the adviser, who stopped short, facing the settee. "'He's gone,' said the freckled man. "'Meaning Livius the Roman?' asked Average Jones. "'Exactly. Lucius Livius, son of Marcus Prinestinus.' 
Are you a representative of this rather peculiar person, may I ask? It would be a dull world except for peculiar persons, observed the man on the settee philosophically. I've seen very many peculiar persons lately by the simple process of coming here day after day. No, I'm not Mr. Livius's representative. I'm only a town-bound and interested observer of his. There you've got the better of me, said Average Jones. I was rather anxious to see him myself. The other looked speculatively at the trim, keen-faced young man. Yet you do not look like a Latin scholar, he observed, if you'll pardon the comment. Nor do you, retorted Jones, if the apology is returnable. I suppose not, owned the other with a sigh. I've often thought that my classical capacity would gain more recognition if I didn't have a skin like Bob Fitzsimmons and hands like Ty Cobb. Nevertheless, I'm in and of the Department of Latin of John Hopkins University. Name Warren. Sit down. Thanks, said the other. Name Jones. Profession, advertising advisor. Object, curiosity. A-V-R-E Jones, better known as Average Jones, I believe. Experte crede, being dog Latin for, you seem to know all about it. The newcomer eyed his vis-a-vis. -vis. Perhaps you uh, know Mr. Robert Bertram, he drawled. Oculus, the eye, Tory of the bull. Bull's eye, said the freckled one with a grin. I've heard of your exploits through Bertram, and thought probably you'd follow the bait contained in my letter to him. Nothing wrong with your nerve system, is there? inquired Average Jones with mock anxiety. Now that I'm here, where is L. Livius? And so forth. Elegantly, but uncomfortably, housed with Colonel Ridgeway Graham in his ancestral barrack on Carteret Street. Is this Colonel Graham a friend of yours? Friend and foe, tried and true. We meet twice a week, usually at his house, to squabble over his method of Latin pronunciation and his construction of the ablative case. He's got a theory of the ablative absolute, said Warren with a scowl, fit to fetch Tacitus howling from the shades. A scholar, then? A very fine and finished scholar, though a fattest of the rankest type, speaks Latin as readily as he does English. Old? Over seventy. Rich? Not in money. Taxes on his big place keep him pinched. That and his passion for buying all kinds of old and rare books. He's got, eh, perhaps, an income of five thousand clair, of which about three thousand goes in book auctions. Any family? No, lives with two ancient colored servants who look after him. How did our friend from B.C. connect up with him? Oh, he ran to the old colonel like a chick to its hen. You see, there aren't so very many Latinists in town during the hot weather. Perhaps eighteen or twenty in all came from about here and from Washington to see the prodigy in the Park of the Boar after the advertisement appeared. He wouldn't have anything to do with any of us. Pretended he didn't understand our kind of Latin. I offered him a place myself at a wage of more denarii than I could well afford. I wanted a chance to study him. Then came the colonel and fairly grabbed him. So I sent for you in my artless professional way. Why so much enthusiasm on the part of Colonel Graham? Simple enough. Livia spoke Latin with an accent which bore out the old boy's contention. I believe they also agreed on the ablative absolute. Yes, er, naturally, drawled Average Jones. Does our early Roman speak pretty ready Latin? He's fairly fluent. Sometimes he stumbles a little in his constructions, and he's apt to be, well, um monkish rather than classical when in full course. Doesn't wear the toga virilis, I suppose. Oh, no. Plain American clothes. It's only his inner man that's Roman, of course. He met with a bump on the head, 
this is his story, and he's got the scar to show for it. And when he came to, he'd lost ground a couple of thousand years and returned to his former existence. No English, no memory of who or what he'd been, no money, no connection whatsoever with the living world. Hmm, huh. wonder if he's been a student of Kipling. You remember the greatest story in the world, the reincarnated galley slave? Now, as to this Colonel Graham, has he ever published? Yes, two small pamphlets issued by the Classicist Press, which publishes the Classical Weekly. Supporting his fads, I suppose. Right, he devoted one pamphlet to each. Average Jones contemplated with absorbed attention an ant which was making a laborious spiral ascent of his cane. Not until it had gained a vantage point on the bone handle did he speak again. See here, Professor Warren, I'm a passionate devotee of the Latin tongue. I have my deep and dark suspicions of our present modes of pronunciation, all three of them. As for the ablative absolute, its reconstruction and regeneration have been the inspiring principle of my studious manhood. Humbly I have sat at the feet of learning, enshrined in the Ridgeway Graham pamphlets. I must meet Colonel Graham, after reading the pamphlets. I hope they're not long. Warren frowned. Colonel Graham is a gentleman and my friend, Mr. Jones, he said with emphasis. I won't have him made a butt. He shan't be by me, Average Jones said quietly. Has it perhaps struck you as his friend that er, a close daily association with the psychic remnant of a Roman citizen might conceivably be non-conducive to his best interest? Yes, it has. I see your point. You want to approach him on his weak side. But have you Latin enough to sustain the part? He's shrewd as a weasel in all matters of scholarship, though a child whom anyone could fool in practical affairs. No, I haven't, admitted Average Jones. Therefore, uh, therefore, I'm a mute. A shock in early childhood paralyzed my centers of speech. I talk to you by sign language, and you interpret. But I hardly know the deaf-mute alphabet. <laughs> Nor I. But I'll waggle my fingers like lightning if he says anything to me requiring an answer, and you'll give the proper reply. Does Colonel Graham implicitly credit the Romanism of his guest? He does because he wants to. To have an educated man of the classic period of the Latin tongue, a friend of Caesar, an auditor of Cicero, and a contemporary of Virgil, Horace, and Ovid, come back and speak in the accent he's contended for, makes a powerful support for his theories. He's at work on a supplementary thesis already. What do the other Latin men who've seen Livius think of the metapsychosis claim? They don't know. Livius explained his remote antecedents only after he had got Colonel Graham's private ear. The colonel has kept it quiet. Don't want a rabble of psychologists and soul pokers worrying him to death, he says. Makes it pretty plain sailing for the Roman. Well, arrange to take me there as soon as possible. At the Graham house... Average Jones was received with simple courtesy by a thin, rosy-cheeked old gentleman with a dagger-like imperial and a dreamy eye, who, on Warren's introduction, made him free of the unkempt old place's hospitality. They conversed for a time, Average Jones maintaining his end with nods and gestures, and, ostensibly, through the digital mediumship of his sponsor. Presently, Warren said to the host, and where is your visitor from the past? Prowling among my books, answered the old gentleman. Are we not going to see him? The colonel looked a little embarrassed. The fact is, Professor Warren, Livius has taken rather an aversion to you. I'm sorry, how so? A twinkle of malice shone in the old scholar's eye. 
He says that your Latin accent frets his nerves, he explained. In that case, said Warren, obeying a quick signal from his accomplice, I'll stroll in the garden while you present Mr. Jones to Livius. Colonel Graham led the way to a lofty wing, once used as a drawing room, but now the repository for thousands of books, which not only filled the shelves but were heaped up in every corner. I must apologize for this confusion, sir, said the host. No one is permitted to arrange my books but myself, and my efforts, I fear, serve only to make confusion more confounded. There are four other rooms even more chaotic than this. At the sound of his voice, a man who had been seated behind a tumulus of volumes rose and stood. Average Jones looked at him keenly. He was perhaps forty-five years of age, thin and sinewy, with a close-shaven face, pale blue eyes, and a narrow forehead running high into a mop of grizzled locks. Diagonally across the front part of the scalp, a scar could be dimly perceived through the hair. Average Jones glanced at the stranger's hands to gain, if possible, some hint of his former employment. With his faculty of swift observation, he noticed that the long, slender fingers were not only mottled with dust, but also scuffed, and in places scarified as if their owner had been hurriedly handling a great number of books. Colonel Graham presented the newcomer in formal Latin. He bowed. The scarred man made a curious gesture of the hand, addressing Average Jones in an accent which, even to the young man's long unaccustomed ears, sounded strange and strained. De illi linguam astringere mutus est, said Colonel Graham, indicating the younger man, and adding a sentence of sonorous metrical Greek. Average Jones recalled the Aeschylean line, Well, though a great ox hath stepped on my tongue, it hasn't trodden out my eyes, praises be, said he to himself, as he caught the uneasy glance of the Roman. By way of allaying suspicion, he scribbled upon a sheet of paper a few complimentary Latin sentences, in which Warren had sedulously coached him for the occasion, and withdrew to the front room, where he was presently joined by the John Hopkins man, Fortunately, the colonel gave them a few minutes together. "'Arrange for me to come here daily to study in the library,' whispered Jones to the Latin professor. The other nodded. "'Now sit tight,' added Jones. He stepped, soft-footed, on the thick old rug, across to the library door, and threw it open. Just inside stood Livius, an expression of startled anger on his thin face." Quickly recovering himself, he explained, in his ready Latin, that he was about to enter and speak to his patron. "'Shows a remarkable interest in possible conversation,' whispered Jones on his withdrawal, "'for a man who understands no English. Also does me the honour to suspect me. He must have been a wily chap in the consulship of Plancus. Before leaving, Average Jones had received from Colonel Graham a general invitation to spend as much time as he chose studying among the books. The old manservant, Saul, had orders to admit him at any hour. He returned to his hotel to write a courteous note of acknowledgment. Many hours has Average Jones spent more tediously than those passed in the cool seclusion of Colonel Ridgeway Graham's treasure house of print. He burrowed among quaint accumulations of forgotten classics. He dipped with astonishment into the savage and ultra Rabelaisian satire of von Hutter's Epistola Obscurorum Virorum, which set early sixteenth century Europe a roar with laughter at the discomfited monks. And he cleansed himself from that tainted atmosphere in the fresh air and free English of a splendid Audubon first. And all the time he was conscious that the Roman watched, watched, watched. More than once, Livius offered aid, seeking to apprise himself of the supposed mute's line of investigation. But the other smilingly fended him off. 
at the end of four days average jones had satisfied himself that if livius were seeking anything in particular he had an indefinite task before him for the colonel's bound treasures were in indescribable confusion apparently he had bought from far and near without definite theme or purpose as he bought he read and having read cast aside and where a volume fell there it had license to lie no cataloguer had ever sought to restore order to that bibliographic riot to seek any given book meant a blind voyage without compass or chart throughout the mingled centuries often colonel graham spent hours in one or the other of the huge book rooms talking with his strange protege and making copious notes usually the old gentleman questioned and the other answered but one morning the attitude seemed to the listening adviser to be reversed livius in the far corner of the room was speaking in a low tone to judge from the older man's impatient manner the roman was interrupting his host's current of queries with interrogations of his own average jones made a mental note and in conference with warren that evening asked him to ascertain from colonel graham whether livius's inquiries had indicated a specific interest in any particular line of reading on the following day however an event of more immediate import occupied his mind he had spent the morning in an upstairs library at the unevadable suggestion of colonel graham while the colonel and his roman collogued below coming down about noon average jones entered the colonel's small study just in time to see livius who was alone in the room turn away sharply from the desk his elbow was held close to his ribs in a peculiar manner he was concealing something under his coat with a pretense of clumsiness average jones stumbled against him in passing livius drew away his high forehead working with suspicion the adviser's expression of blank apology eked out with a bow and a grimace belied the busy working mind within for in the moment's contact he had heard the crisp rustle of paper from beneath the ill-fitting coat what paper had the man from b c taken furtively from his benefactor's table it must be large otherwise he could have readily thrust it into his pocket no sooner was livius out the room than average jones scanned the desk his face lighted with a sudden smile colonel graham never read a newspaper boasted in fact that he wouldn't have one about the place but as average jones distinctly recalled he had himself that very morning brought in a copy of the globe and dropped it into the scrap basket near the writing table it was gone livius had taken it if he's got the newspaper reading habit said average jones to himself i'll set a trap for him but warren must furnish the bait he went to look up his aid the conference between them was long and exhaustive covering the main points of the case from the beginning did you find out from colonel graham inquired average jones whether livius affected any particular brand of literature yes he seems to be specializing in late seventeenth-century british classicism apparently he considers that the flower of british scholarship of that time wrote in a very inferior kind of dog latin late seventeenth-century latinity commented average jones that uh, gives us a fair start now as to the body servant old saul i questioned him about strange collars he said he remembered only two besides an occasional peddler or agent they were looking for work what kind of work inside the house one wanted to catalogue the library what did he look like saul said he wore glasses and a worse tall hat than the colonel's and had a full beard and the other bookbinder and repairer wanted to fix up colonel graham's collection young 
smartly dressed with a small waxed moustache. "'And our Livius is clean-shaven,' murmured Average Jones. "'How long apart did they call?' "'About two weeks. The second applicant came on the day of the last snowfall. I looked that up. It was March 27th. "'Do you know, Warren,' observed Average Jones, "'I sometimes think that part of your talents, at least, are wasted in a chair of Latin.' "'Certainly there is more excitement in this hide-and-seek game, as you play it, "'than in the pursuits of a musty pedant,' admitted the other, cracking his large knuckles. "'But when are we going to spring upon friend Livius and strip him of his fake toga?' "'That's the easiest part of it. "'I've, I've already caught him, filling a fountain pen as if he'd been brought up on them, "'and humming the spinning chorus from the Flying Dutchman.' not to mention the lifting of my newspaper. Nemo mortalium omnibus hora sapit, murmured Warren. No, as you say, no fellow can be on the job all the time. But our problem is not to catch Livius, but to find out what it is he's been after for the last three months. Three months? You're assuming that it was he who aspired for work in the library? Certainly. And when he failed at that, he set about a very carefully developed scheme to get at Colonel Graham's books anyway. By inquiries, he found out the old gentleman's fad and proceeded to get in training for it. You don't know, perhaps, that I have a corps of assistants who clip, catalog, and file all unusual advertisements. Here is one they turned up for me on my order to send me any queer educational advertisements. Wanted. Daily lessons in Latin speech from a competent Spanish scholar. Right. Box 347, Banner Office. That is from the New York Banner of April 3rd, shortly after the strange caller's second abortive attempt to get into the Graham Library. I suppose our Livius figured out that Colonel Graham's theory of accent was about what a Spaniard would have. But he couldn't have learned all his Latin in four months. He didn't. He was a scholar already, an accomplished one, who went wrong through drink and became a crook, specializing in rare books and prints. His name is Enderby. You'll find it in the Harvard catalog. He's supposed to be dead. My assistant traced him through his Spanish-Latin teacher, a priest. But even allowing for his scholarship, he must have put in a deal of work perfecting himself in readiness of speech and accent. So he did. Therefore the prize must be big. A man of Enderby's caliber doesn't concoct a scheme of such ingenuity and go into bondage with it for nothing. Do you belong to the Cosmic Club? The assistant professor stared. No, he said. I'd like to put you up there. One advantage of membership is that its rosters include experts in every known line of erudition, from scarabs to skiing. For example, I am now going to telegraph for aid from old Millington, who seldom misses a book auction and is a human bibliography of the wanderings of all rare volumes. I'm going to find out from him what British publication of the late 17th century in Latin is very valuable. Also, what volumes at that time have changed hands in the last six months. Colonel Graham went to a big book auction in New York in early March, volunteered Warren, but he told me he didn't pick up anything of particular value. Then it's something he doesn't know about, and Livius does. I'm going to take advantage of our Roman's rather un-BC-like habit of reading the daily papers by trying him out with this advertisement. Average Jones wrote rapidly and tossed the results to his coadjutor, who read, Lost. Old book printed in Latin. Buff leather binding, a little faded. It's safe to be that, explained Average Jones. No great value except to owner. Return to Colonel Ridgeway Graham, 11 Carteret Street, and receive reward. The advertisement made its appearance in big type on the front pages of the Baltimore paper of the following day. That evening, Average Jones met Warren for dinner with a puckered brow. 
Did Livius rise to the bait? asked the scholar. Did he? chuckled Average Jones. He's been nervous as a cat all day and hardly has looked at the library. But what puzzles me is this. He exhibited a telegram from New York. Millington says positively no book of that time and description of any great value. Enderby at Barclay auction in March and made a row over some book which he missed because it was put up out of turn in the catalogue. Barclay Auctioneer thinks it was one of Percival privately bound volumes 1680 to 1703. An anonymous book of Percival Library, Demeritus Librorum Britannorum, was sold to Colonel Graham for $47, a good price. When do I get in on this? Signed, Robert Bertram. I know that treatise, said Warren. It isn't particularly rare. Average Jones stared at the telegram in silence. Finally, he drawled, There are uh, books and uh, books and uh, things in books. Wait here for me. Three hours later, he reappeared with collar wilted but spirits elate, and abruptly announced, Warren, I'm a cobbler. A what? A cobbler. Mend your boots, you know. Are you in earnest? Certainly. Haven't you ever remarked that a serious-minded earnestness always goes with cobbling? Though I'm not really a practical cobbler, but a proprietary one, our friend Bertram will dress and act the practical part. I've wired him, and he's replied, collect, accepting the job. You and I will be in the background. Where? Number 27 Jasmine Street. Not a very savory locality. Why is it, Warren, that the beauty of a city street is generally an inverse ratio to the poetic quality of its name? There, I've hired the shop and stock of Mr. Hans Fichtel, for two days, at the handsome rental of ten dollars per day. Mr. Fichtel proposes to take a keg of beer a-fishing. I think two days will be enough. For the keg? For that noble Roman, Livius. He'll be reading the papers pretty keenly now, and in tomorrow's he'll find this advertisement. Average Jones read from a sheet of paper which he took from his pocket. Found. Old book in foreign language, probably Latin, marked Percival. Owner may recover by giving satisfactory description of peculiar and obscure feature and refunding for advertisement. Fictal, 27 Jasmine Street. What is the peculiar and obscure feature, Jones? asked Warren. I don't know. How do you know there is any? Must be something peculiar about the book, or Enderby wouldn't have put in four months of work on the chance of stealing it. And it must be obscure, otherwise the auctioneer would have spotted it. Sound enough, approved the other. What could it be? Some interpolated page? Hardly. I've got a treatise in my pocket on 17th century bookmaking, which I'm going to study tonight. Be ready for an early start to meet Bertram. That languid and elegant gentleman arrived by the first morning train. He protested mightily when he was led to the humble shoe shop. He protested more mightily when invited to don a leather apron and smudge his face appropriately to his trade. His protests, waxing vehement and eventually profane as he barked his daintily kept fingers in rehearsal for giving a correct representation of an honest artisan cobbling a boot, died away when Average Jones explained to him that on pretense of having found a rare book, he was to worm out of a cautious and probably suspicious criminal the nature of some unique and hidden feature of the volume. "'Trust me for diplomacy,' said Bertram airily. "'I will because I've got to,' retorted Average Jones. "'Well, get to work. "'To you, the outer shop, 
to Warren and me this rear room. And remember, if you hear me whetting a knife, that means come at once. Uncomfortably twisted into a supposedly professional posture, Bertram wrought with hammer and last, while putting off with lame, blind, and halting excuses such as came to call for their promised footgear. By a triumph of tact, he had just disposed of a rancid-tongued female who demanded her husband's boots. A satisfactory explanation, or the arbitrament of the lists, when the bell tinkled and the two watchers in the back room heard a nervous, cultivated voice say, "'Is Mr. Fickle here?' "'That's me,' said Bertram, landing an agonizing blow on his thumbnail. "'You advertised that you'd found an old book.' "'Yes, sir. Someone left it in the post office.' "'Ah, that must have been when I went to mail some letters to New York,' said the other glibly. "'From the advertised description, this book is without doubt mine.' now as to the reward excuse me but you wouldn't expect me to give it up without any identification sir certainly not it was demeritus liberor i can't read latin sir but you can make that much out said the visitor with rising exasperation come if it's a matter of the reward how much i wouldn't mind having a good reward say ten dollars but I want to be sure it's your book. There's something about it that you could easily tell me, sir, for anyone could see it. A very observant shoemaker, commented the other with a slight sneer. You mean the, uh, half-split cover? Swish, 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 sounded from the rear room. Excuse me, said Bertram, who had not ceased from his pretended work. I have to get a piece of leather. He stepped into the back room, where Average Jones, his face alight, held up a piece of paper upon which he had hurriedly scrawled, manuscript bound into cover. Get it out of him. Tell him you have a brother who is a Latin scholar. Bertram nodded, caught up a strip of calfskin, and returned. Yes, sir, he said. The split cover and what's inside. The other started. "'You didn't get it out!' he cried. "'You didn't tear it!' "'No, sir, it's there safe enough. "'But some of it can be made out.' "'You said you didn't read Latin.' "'No, sir, but I have a brother that went through the academy. "'He reads a little.' "'This was thin ice, but Bertram went forward with assumed assurance. "'He thinks the manuscript is quite rare. "'Oh, Fritz, come in!' "'Any letter of Bacon's is rare, of course,' returned the other impatiently. "'Therefore, I propose offering you fifty dollars reward.' He looked up as Average Jones entered. The young man's sleeves were rolled up. His face was generously smudged, and a strip of cobbler's wax beneath the upper lip puffed and distorted the firm line of his mouth. Further, his head was louting low on his neck, so that the visitor got no view sufficient for recognition. Lord Bacon's letter uh, must be uh, pretty rare, mister, he drawled thickly. But a letter uh, from Lord Bacon uh, about Shakespeare? That ought to be worth a lot of money. Average Jones had taken his opening with his customary incisive shrewdness. The mention of Bacon has settled it to his mind. Only one imaginable character of manuscript from the philosopher, scholar, politician could have value enough to tempt a thief of Enderby's caliber. Enderby's expression told that the shot was a true one. As for Bertram, he had dropped his shoemaker's knife and his shoemaker's roll. Bacon on Shakespeare? Shades of the departed glory of Ignatius Donnelly. The visitor drew back. Warren's gaunt frame appeared in the doorway. Joan's head lifted. It ought to be as uh, unique, he drawled, as an uh, ancient Roman speaking perfect English. Like a flash, 
the false livius caught up the knife from the bench where the false cobbler had dropped it and swung toward average jones at the moment the ample hand of professor warren bunched into a highly competent fist flicked across and caught the assailant under the ear enderby alias livius fell as if smitten by a cestus as his arm touched the floor average jones kicked unerringly at the wrist and the knife flew and tinkled into a far corner bertram with a bound landed on the fallen man's chest and pinned him did he get you average he cried not a uh, this time pretty good teamwork drawled the adviser we've got our man for felonious assault at least enderby panting under bertram's solid knee blinked and struggled no use livius said average jones might as well quiet down and confess ease up a little on him bert take a look at that scar of his first though superficial cut treated with makeup a clever job pronounced bertram after a quick examination as i supposed said average jones let me in on the deal pleaded livius that letter is worth ten thousand twelve thousand fifteen thousand dollars anything you want to ask if you find the right purchaser and you can't manage it without me let me in thinks we're crooks too remarked average jones exactly what's in this wonderful letter it's from bacon to the author of the book who wrote about sixteen ten bacon prophesied that shakespeare this vagabond and humble mummer would outshine and outlive in fame all the genius of his time that's all i could make out by loosening the stitches well that's worth anything one could demand said warren in a somewhat awed tone why didn't you get the letter when you were examining it at the auction room inquired average jones some fool of a binder had overlooked the double cover and sewn it in i noticed it at the auction gummed the opening together while no one was watching and had gone to get cash to buy the book but the auctioneer put it up out of turn and old graham got it bring it to me i'll show you the pursed cover many of percival's books were bound that way we've never had it nor seen it replied average jones the advertisement was only a trap into which you stepped enderby's jaw dropped then it's still at the graham house he cried beating on the floor with his free hand take me back there oh we'll take you said warren grimly close packed among them in a cab they drove him back to carteret street colonel ridgeway graham was at home and greeted them courteously you found livius he said with relief i had begun to fear for him colonel graham began average jones you have what speech cried the old gentleman and you a mute what does this mean never mind him broke in enderby livius there's something more important but the colonel had shrunk back english from you livius he cried setting his hand to his brow all will be explained in time colonel warren assured him meanwhile you have a document of the utmost importance and value do you remember buying one of the percival volumes at the barclay auction the collector drew his brows down in an effort to remember an octavo in fairly good condition he asked yes yes cried enderby eagerly where is it what did you do with it it was in latin very false latin the foreman leaned forward breathless oh i remember it slipped from my pocket and fell into the river as i was crossing the ferry to jersey there was a dead flat stricken silence then average jones turned hollow eyes upon warren professor he said with a rueful attempt at a smile what's the past participle passive plural of the latin verb to sting
End of The Man Who Spoke Latin by Samuel Hopkins Adams Recorded by Catherine Edman